which holds high hopes about his apparent interest in political reform. But those hopes are dashed in 2011. That year in Tunisia, a street vendor sets fire to himself, sparking the so-called Arab Spring. A tidal wave of rebellion sweeps across the Middle East and regimes collapse one by one. Tunisia in January, Egypt in February, Libya come October. Assad and his inner circle look on in alarm. He decides Syria will not capitulate to protesters. He decides dissent will be crushed. And so it is when the first protests erupt in Syria in the city of Daraa. Witnesses say that Syrian forces opened fire on hundreds of youths. Furious at the torture of local teenagers who sprayed a wall with anti-Assad graffiti, thousands take to the streets to protest. Assad is at first conciliatory, but the son soon proves to be equally as ruthless as the father. Human Rights Watch says it has recent images of numerous protesters being tortured. The response provokes only more demonstrations. Syria quickly spirals into a civil war. Small groups of armed rebels begin to appear and the war takes on complex but distinct sectarian dimensions. Many in the country's majority Sunni population rise up against decades of the Assad's Shia Alawite rule. The depths to which all sides plumb shock the world and make reconciliation seem virtually impossible. Assad's government deploys barrel bombs and reports emerge of the use of chemical weapons in the town of Ghouta. Amid the chaos, rebels on the ground splinter and the Islamic State arrives. It capitalizes on the mayhem, carving out and defending its own brutal caliphate. Russia intervenes on behalf of Assad's government and IS battles to retain its territory. Assad disputes this version of events, blaming the entire uprising on the interference of his regional enemies backed by the West. What is not in dispute is that Syria, once a jewel in the Arab world's crown, is now a country in ruins. After five years of conflict, the government controls only 40% of the territory. Assad and his allies stand accused of war crimes, including targeting civilian hospitals. This is a highly complex war of attrition between multiple groups on the ground, and each side has different foreign backers. Here's the human cost of a pre-war population of over 20 million people. Nearly half a million Syrians have been killed and 1.9 million injured. More than 6.5 million are internally displaced and 4.8 million have become refugees, escaping with their lives and then risking them again in the hope of making a fresh start in a new land. Assad now battles to keep Syria intact the world is now turned upside down by one man's insistence that he remain in power. The interview took place in the presidential palace in Damascus and was recorded just two days ago. just crossed the Lebanese border bound for the Syrian capital of Damascus and I was here just a few months ago covering the humanitarian crisis and even spent some time embedded on the front line of the battlefield but this trip will be very different. I've finally been granted a sit-down interview with the Syrian president Bashar al-Assad and I'm intrigued to hear what this man has to say after presiding over this country for more than five years of bloodshed and destruction. Mr. President, thank you for speaking with SBS Australia. You're most welcome, Mr. It's now more than five years since the Syrian crisis began. It's estimated somewhere around a quarter of a million people have been killed, many, many of them civilians. Um, there's an undeniable human, humanitarian disaster. How far into the crisis do you think you are, and is there an end in sight? Uh, of course, there's uh, insight, and uh, the solution is very uh, clear. It's uh, 
uh, simple yet impossible. It's a simple because the solution is very clear uh, how to make it a uh, discussion between the Syrian dialogue, between the Syrian about uh, the, uh, the political process, but at the same time uh, fighting the terrorism and the terrorists in Syria. Without uh, fighting terrorists, you cannot have any real uh, solution. Uh, it's impossible because the country that supported those terrorists, whether Western or regional like Turkey, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, don't want to stop sending all kind of support to those terrorists. So if we start with stopping this logistical support and as Syrians go to dialogue, talk about the constitution, about the future of Syria, about the future of the political system, the solution is very near, not far from the reach. Much of the reporting at the West at the moment suggests that the demise of the Islamic State is imminent. Do you believe that's true? And how far away from seizing Raqqa, this very important city of Raqqa, do you believe you are? Uh, it's not a race. Uh, uh, Raqqa is as important as Aleppo, as Damascus, as any other uh, city. Uh, the danger uh, of those uh, terrorist groups is not about what land do they occupy, because it's not a traditional war. It's about how much of their ideology can they instill in the mind of the people in the area that they sit or live in. Indoctrination, this is the most dangerous thing. Uh, so uh, reaching Araqa is not that uh, difficult uh, militarily, let's say. It's a matter of time. We are going in that direction. But the question when you talk about war is about what the other side, let's say the enemy, could do. And that's directly related to the effort of Turkey, especially Erdogan, in supporting those groups, because that's what's happening since the beginning. If you talk about Syria as isolated military field, you can, you can reach that area within a few months or few weeks, let's say. Uh, but without taking into consideration the Turkish effort in supporting the terrorists, any answer would be a, a far cry from the reality, unfactual uh, answer. Mr. President, how concerned are you about recent fatal clashes between your longtime ally Hezbollah and uh, your own forces? Bet uh, fighting between us and, and Hezbollah? They are no fighting. They, they support uh, the Syrian army. Mm -hmm. They don't fight against the Syrian army. They, they fight with the Syrian army. The Syrian army and Hezbollah, with the support of the Russian air for forces, we are fighting all kinds of terrorist uh, groups, uh, whether al-ISIS uh, or al-Nusra or other affiliated uh, group with Al-Qaeda that's affiliated uh, automatically to Al-Nusra and uh, ISIS. So there have been some recent reports of clashes between, are those reports incorrect? No, they are talking not about clashes, about let's say differences in different opinions. Uh, that's not true. Uh, and if you look at the uh, meeting that happened recently between the Minister of Defense in uh, Iran, in Tehran, uh, Syrian, Russian and Iranian, and this means uh, there's a good coordination regarding fighting terrorism. To be clear, do you categorize all uh, opposition groups as terrorists? No, definitely not, no. Uh, when you talk about uh, uh, opposition group that uh, adopt the political uh, means, they're not terrorists. Whenever you hold machine guns or in other armaments, armaments and you terrorize people and you attack civilians and you attack public and private properties, you are terrorists. But if you talk about opposition, when you talk about opposition, it must be Syrian opposition. It cannot be a surrogate opposition that uh, work as a proxy to other countries like Saudi Arabia or any other country. It must be Syrian opposition that's related to, the, to its Syrian uh, grassroots. Like in your country, it's the same, I think. You said recently um, that the ceasefire offered Syrian people at least a glimmer of hope. How five months on do you think that hope is going? Yeah, it is. It's still uh, working, this ceasefire. But uh, with that, we don't have to forget that the, uh, terrorist groups violate this agreement on a daily basis. But at the same time, we have the right, according to that agreement, to retaliate whenever the terrorists attack uh, our uh, government forces. So actually, you can say it's still working in most of the areas, but in some area, it's not. There are various accounts of how the Syrian crisis began. Some say it was uh, children graffitiing anti-government slogans and they were dealt with brutally by, by the government. Um, I understand you don't accept that narrative. How, in your view, did the crisis begin? Uh, it's a mixture of many uh, things. Some people uh, demonstrated because they needed reform. 
we cannot uh, deny this. We cannot say no, everybody was a terrorist or everyone was a uh, mercenary. But the majority of those demonstrators, I'm not talking about the genuine demonstrator, uh, were paid by Qatar in order to demonstrate. Then later they paid by Qatar in order to revolt with armaments. And that's how it started actually. The story of a children being attacked, that's, this is an elusive story, it didn't happen. Of course, you always have, let's say, mistakes happening in the practice on the ground, like, like what happened in, in the United States recently d d during the last year. But this is not a, a, a reason for people to hold machine guns and kill policemen and soldiers and so on. You do say that some of these people legitimately needed reform. Was that as a result of any heavy handedness from uh, your government at all? No, we had the reform in Syria started uh, mainly uh, uh, into after 2000, in the year 2000. Some people think it was slow, some people think it was too fast. This is, subje this is subjective, not objective. But we were moving in, uh, uh, in that uh, regard. But the proof that it wasn't about the reform, because we, we made all the requested reform after the, uh, the crisis started uh, five years ago, and nothing has changed. So it wasn't about reform. We changed the constitution, we changed the law that they, the opposition asked for, uh, we changed many things, but nothing happened. So it wasn't about the reform. It was about money coming from Qatar, and most of the people that genuinely asked for reform at the, begin the beginning of the crisis, they don't uh, demonstrate now. They don't go against the government. They, they, they cooperate with the government. They don't uh, believe, let's say, in the uh, political line of this government. And this is their right, and that's natural. But they don't work against the government because, uh, or against the state institutions. So they distinguish themselves from the people who supported the terrorists. How do you respond to the fact that some of your own ministers defected and uh, cited brutality as a, as a reason? Actually, they defected because uh, they've been asked to do so by uh, some of them Saudi Arabia, some of them by France. It depends on the country they belong to. And now they are belonging to that so-called opposition that belonged to those countries, not to the Syrian. They have no values in Syria. So we wouldn't worry about, about that. It, it didn't change anything. I mean, it didn't affect the fact or the reality in Syria. One of your main backers, Russia, has called for a return to the peace talks. Um, do you think that's a good idea? You mean in Geneva? Yes. Yeah, of course, we support, we, we support every talk with every Syrian uh, party. But in reality, those talks uh, hasn't been started yet. And there's no Syrian Syrian talk till this moment, because we only made negotiations with the facilitator, which is Mr. De Mistura. Actually, it hasn't started. So we support the principle, but in practice, you need to have certain methodology that didn't exist so far. So we need to start, but we need to have the, uh, the bas ba basic principles for those negotiations to be fruitful. One thing that intrigues a lot of people about the Syrian crisis is why your uh, close allies, Iran and Russia, stay so loyal. Uh, because it wasn't about the president, it's not, it's not about the person. This is uh, the misinterpretation or let's say the misconception in the West and maybe part of the propaganda that Russia and Iran supported Assad or supported the president. It's not like this. Uh, it's about the whole situation. The chaos in Syria will, is going to uh, provoke a domino effect in our region that's going to affect the neighboring countries, is going to affect Iran, it's going to affect Russia, it's going to affect Europe, actually. So when they defend Syria, they defend the stability, and they defend their stability, they defend their interests. And at the same time, it's about the principle, they defend the Syrian people in their right to protect themselves. Because if they defend the president and the Syrian people are not with him, don't support him, I cannot withstand five years just because Russia and Iran support me. So it's not about the president, it's about the whole situation, the bigger picture, let's say. Do you have any dialogue, either direct or indirectly, with the United States? At all, nothing at all. Indirect, yes. Indirect through different channels. But if you ask them, they, they will uh, deny it, and we're going to deny it. <laughs> but in reality, it exists, the back channels. What, but, what, what are some of those channels? I mean, uh, let's say a businessman going traveling around the world and meeting with the officials in the United States, I mean, in Europe, they meet in Europe, and they try to convey certain messages, but there's nothing serious because we don't think the administration, the American administration, is serious about solving the problem in Syria. 
Well, quite recently, there were reports more than 50 diplomats have called for what they describe as real and effective military strikes against you, against yeah. Syria. Does this in any way concern you? And do you think it signals a more aggressive policy from the United States towards Syria moving forward? No, warmongers uh, in every uh, American administration always exist. It's, it's not something new. But we wouldn't uh, uh, give a fig, let's say, about uh, this communique, because it's not about this communique. It's about the policy. It's about the actions. Uh, the difference between this uh, administration and the previous one, Bush's one, that Bush sent his troops, this one is sending mercenary and turn blind eye to what uh, Saudi Arabia and Turkey and Qatar did since the beginning of the crisis. So it's the same policy. It's a militaristic, militaristic policy, but in different ways. So this communique is not different from the reality on the ground. This is asking for war, and the reality is war. You refer to the previous government, the Bush government. Um, uh, there are some who say one of the reasons uh, you've survived as long as a government has been America's reluctance to get on the ground in another war in the Middle East. Do you not accept that based on what you're saying? Yeah, the, the American administration since the 50s are very famous of creating problems, but uh, they never solve any problem. And that's what happened in Iraq. Bush invaded Iraq. In a few weeks, he could occupy Iraq. But then what's, what's next? It's not about occupying. This is a great power. We're not a great power. So it's not about uh, America occupying Syria. What's next? What do they want to achieve? They haven't achieved anything. They have failed in, in Libya, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Syria, everywhere. They only created chaos. So if the United States want to create more chaos, it can. It can create chaos. But can they solve the problem? No. Do you have a preference um, who wins the upcoming US election? Uh, actually, no. We, we never bet on any American president because uh, Usually what they say in the campaign is different from their practice after they become uh, president. And uh, Obama is an example. So we don't have to wait. We have to wait and see what policy they're going to adopt, whoever wins the elections. So you can see a circumstance where uh, Syria would work collaboratively with the United States and the West? We don't have problem with the United States. They're not our enemy. They don't occupy our land. We have differences. And those differences go back to, to the 70s and maybe before that. But uh, we, 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 in many, uh, uh, many different times, let's say, and uh, events and uh, uh, circumstances, we had cooperation with the United States. So we're not against this cooperation. But this cooperation means talking about and discussing and working for the mutual interest, not for the interest at the expenses of our interests. That's it. So we don't have a problem. Mr. President, um, you've spent a lot of time yourself, uh, as you've just said, in, uh, in the United Kingdom. Can you see there being any repercussions for Britain's decision to exit the um, European Union for Syria and for the Syrian crisis? Yeah. Uh, maybe, uh, I don't think I can elaborate about that as it's a British issue. I'm not British, uh, neither European. But at the same time, I can say that uh, this uh, uh, surprising maybe result uh, has many different components, whether the internal as economic and external as uh, the worry from uh, the terrorism, security issues, refugees, uh, and so on. Uh, but this is indication for us as those officials who used to give me the advice about how to deal with the crisis in Syria and say Assad must go and he's disconnected, proven that to be disconnected from the reality. Otherwise, they wouldn't have asked for this uh, referendum. Uh, but I think this is a revolt uh, of the uh, people there against, uh, I would call them sometimes second tire politicians. They, need, uh, uh, they needed a special, uh, let's say, uh, st statecraft uh, uh, official to, to deal uh, their country. If another administration came and understand that the issue of refugees and security is related to the problem in our region, this is where you're going to have different policies that will affect us positively. But I don't have now uh, a lot of hopes about this. Let's say we have slim hope, because we don't know what's going to come uh, after Cameron in, in the UK. Can I ask, Australia is part of the uh, international coalition to defeat Islamic State. Obviously, that's one of your goals. So in that instance, there's a shared goal. Do you welcome international intervention when there is a shared goal like that? Actually, uh, we welcome any effort to fight terrorism in Syria, any effort. But this effort, first of all, should be genuine, not uh, uh, window dressing like what's happening now in the northern uh, Syria, where 60 countries couldn't 
prevent ISIS from expanding. Actually, when the Russian uh, air support started, only that time when ISIS started expanding. So it needs to be genuine. Second, it needs to be through the Syrian legitimate government, not just because they want to fight terrorism and they can go anywhere in the world. We, ha we, are, we are legitimate government and uh, we are a sovereign country. So only under these two circumstances, we welcome any foreign support to fight terrorism. A number of Australians have died fighting for either the Kurdish militia or uh, Islamic State. Do you have a message for these young people who feel so enraged by what's taking place in Syria that they travel um, over here to fight? Again, the same, uh, let's say, uh, answer. If, if uh, uh, there's foreigners coming without the permission of the government, they are illegal. Whether they want to fight terrorists or want uh, to fight any other one, it's the same. It's illegal, we can call it. Mr. President, Australian politicians have used very strong language uh, about your role in the crisis, as have other leaders internationally. Um, Australia's Prime Minister has referred to you as a murderous tyrant, um, saying that you're responsible for killing thousands of innocent civilians. Australia's op opposition leader has called you a butcher. Yet Australia's official position is still to work with you um, toward a peace agreement. How do you reconcile those two very different uh, positions? Actually, uh, this is the, the double standard of the West in general. They attack us politically and they send us uh, the, uh, officials to deal with us under the table, especially the security, including your government. They, they, they all uh, do the same. Uh, they don't want to upset the United States. Actually, most of the Western officials, they only repeat what the United States want them to say. This is the, the reality. Uh, so uh, I think these statements, just I can say they are disconnected from our reality because I'm, I'm, not, I'm fighting terrorists. Our army fighting terrorists. Our government is against terrorists. The whole institution are against terrorists. If you call fighting terrorism a butchery, that's another issue. Australia has agreed to take in an additional 12,000 Syrian refugees. Um, some have already arrived. Do you have a message for the Syrians, many of whom still say they love Syria and, yeah. and they want to return? Do you have a message to those people as they settle in Australia and other countries around the world? I should mention a very important point. Most of the refugees that left Syria, they wanted to come back to, come back to Syria. So any country that helped them enter their new country, let's say, their new homeland, uh, is welcome as a humanitarian action. But again, there's something more humanitarian and less costly, is to help them stay in their country, help them going back by helping the stability in Syria, not giving any umbrella or support to the terrorists. That's what they want. They want the Western government to take uh, decisive uh, uh, decision against what Saudi Arabia and other Western countries like France and UK doing in order to support the terrorists in Syria against the government, just to topple the government. Uh, otherwise, those Syrians wouldn't have left Syria. Most of them, they didn't leave because uh, they are against the government or with the government. They left because it's uh, very difficult to live in Syria these days. Do you hope these people will return and would you facilitate for them to return? Definitely. I mean, losing uh, uh, people as refugees is like losing human resources. How can you build a country without human resources? Most of those people are educated, uh, well-trained. Uh, uh, they have their own uh, business in Syria, in different uh, domains. You lose all this? Of course we need. The Commission for International Justice and Accountability says there are thousands of government documents which say has proved your government sanctioned mass torture and killings. Uh, in the face of that evidence, how do you say that no crimes have taken place? And I point also to other independent organisations which are critical of um, deliberate targeting of hospitals. Um, uh, do you concede that some mistakes have been made as you've targeted some of these rebel-held areas? You are talking about two different things. Yes. One of them, the first one is the reports. Uh, the most important report that's been uh, financed by Qatar just to defame the Syrian government. And they have no proof who took the picture, who are the victims in those pictures, and so on. Like, uh, you can forge anything, if you want now, on the, uh, on the computer. So it's, it's not credible at all. Uh, second, talking about attacking uh, hospitals or attacking civilians. The question, the very simple question is, why do we, why do we attack hospitals and, and civilians? I mean, the whole issue, the whole problem is Syria started when those terrorists wanted to win the hearts of the Syrians. 
So attacking hospitals or attacking civilians is playing into the hands of the terrorists. So if we put the values aside now for, for, for a while, let's talk about the interest. No government in this uh, situation have any interest in uh, killing civilians or attacking hospitals. Anyway, if you attack hospitals, you can use any building for to be a hospital. No, these are uh, anecdotal claims, uh, mendacious statements, I can say. They're not credible at all. We still sending vaccines to those areas under the control of the terrorists. So how can I send vaccines and attack the hospitals? This is contradiction. Mr. President, as a father and as a man, has there been one anecdote, one story, one image from the crisis which has affected you personally more than others? Definitely. Definitely. We are a human and, and I'm Syrian like the other Syrian. I, I will be more sympathetic with any Syrian uh, tragedy affecting any person or family. Uh, and in this uh, region, we are very emotional people, uh, generally. Uh, but uh, as an official, uh, I'm not the only person, I'm official. As official, the first question you ask when you have that feeling is what, what are you going to do? What are you going to do to protect other Syrians from the same suffering? That's the most important thing. So that, that, that's what can, I mean, this feeling, this uh, sad feeling, this painful feeling is incentive for me to do more. It's not only a feeling. What's your vision for Syria? How do you see things in two to three years? After the crisis, or <laughs> so the, God, the first, God, the first thing we, we would like to see is to have Syria stable as it used to, it used to be before, because it was one of the most stable country and secure country around the world, not only in, in our region. So this is the first thing. If you have this, you can, you can have other ambitions. Without it, you, you cannot. I mean, if you have it, the, the other question, how to deal with the new generation that live the life of killing that saw the extremism or learned the, terror, the extremism or indoctrinated by Al-Qaeda, affiliated groups, and so on. This is another challenge. The third one, bringing back those human resources that left as refugees in order to rebuild Syria. Rebuilding the country as building and so on, our infrastructure is very easy. We, we, we are capable of doing this as Syrians. This challenge is about the new generation. How do you think history will reflect on your presidency? What I wish is to be to say that this is the one who saved his country from the terrorists and from the external intervention. That's what I wish about. Anything else would be left to the judgment of the Syrian people, but this is my only wish. Mr. President, thank you very much for speaking with SBS Australia. Thank you very much. Well, here in the studio, I have Bob Bowker, former ambassador to Syria and now adjunct professor at the Center for Arab and Islamic Studies in Canberra. Welcome to you, Bob. First thoughts on that interview? Well, I thought it was a very polished performance by someone who clearly now feels more confident that his regime will survive, even if perhaps Syria does not. Uh, it was, I think, disappointing that he failed to acknowledge the extent to which uh, the lives of uh, perhaps 400,000 Syrians and the, uh, the uh, homes of uh, 9 million Syrians plus have uh, been lost uh, while he has been in control of that government. In terms of how the conflict started, we saw there President Assad blaming Qatar for paying the demonstrators, blaming outsiders, in other, in other words. What do you make of that? Yeah, it's a consistent theme uh, of Assad. The reality is that whereas Assad presented himself in that interview as a reformist, uh, his role as a, as a leader of reform in Syria had pretty much dissipated about five years before the uprising began. And there was a high level of frustration uh, with his leadership at that stage, uh, plus a, a high level of economic stress and other factors which contributed to the uprising. And when uh, the regime responded with great brutality uh, toward those expressions of, of discontent, uh, really he triggered a process uh, which rapidly evolved into a military confrontation. Well, one of the things we know about is those attacks on children. He denies that. It never happened, he said. How much culpability do you think he bears for those attacks on civilians? I think a very high level of culpability uh, because without those uh, excessive instances of force by the regime, it would have been very difficult to mobilise the level of activity that followed uh, in Homs and, and Hummer and elsewhere. So he's been much more uh, determined, I think, to lay the blame elsewhere 
than to acknowledge that indeed uh, he was leading a corrupt, repressive regime which ensured a high level of stability, as he rightly pointed out, uh, for Syrian people, but which basically failed to address the needs, uh, the reasonable needs, of a, a new generation of Syrians who expected to have a voice in decisions affecting their futures. In terms of pointing the fingers, he's, he's scathing about Western government, saying they're hypocritical, they, they're criticising him politically, but at the same time dealing with Syria under the table, as he put it, and he includes Australia in that. You've got a lot of direct experience in that kind of diplomacy. Do, is, well, what's your response to that? I think he's over-egging his argument somewhat. Uh, the reality, I think, is that Assad uh, is seen in the West as an unfit leader uh, to be dealt with. Uh, and in the rest of the Arab world as well. Uh, he has lost the uh, credibility that he enjoyed early in his uh, period as president uh, through a series of miscalculations on his part rather than through the, uh, the behaviour of uh, those other Gulf states to which he was constantly referring in that interview. From a human rights perspective, there is a view that he should be facing a war crimes tribunal and what do you think the chances are of his regime him particularly facing repercussions for his actions in this conflict i think the likelihood of assad or members of his regime fronting a crimes tribunal uh, is very very remote uh, uh, if there is to be a, a process of justice at the end of this conflict, it would be something which would be uh, driven within Syria itself. We're looking at a situation in which uh, there may be no end to this conflict and the uh, fundamental causes of the conflict remaining dormant uh, uh, and potentially reactivated further down the track. A very complex situation. Thanks so much for sharing your time tonight, Bob. My pleasure. And thanks to you for watching this SBS special interview with President Bashar al-Assad. It's available at SBS On Demand and you can explore our in-depth coverage at sbs.com.au slash news. Good night. They are the architects of the world as we know it. Socrates, Confucius and the Buddha. Genius of the ancient world. Next on SPS.